So this is a little different episode of Uncle Tony's Garage. So you wonder why am I sitting in a Mustang? Why am I holding this magazine? And why are we at English Town, Racewick Park? It's my home away from home for years. And a lot of stuff went down here. A lot of stuff surrounding this magazine, Cars Illustrated. And that car, that was my Mustang. It's actually a twin to this thing. And today, I'm not really running this show. My friend Evan Smith is. What's up, Tony? What's happening, brother man? This is Evan Smith from Muscle Mustangs and Fast Forward. Neil here. And this is my brother from another mother. That's me. Neil Hanope. And we're wearing Hawaiian shirts because in 1985, that's what the well dressed street racer was wearing. <laughs> so, Evan, what do you think? So, all right. So, Tony and Neil, you guys on the channel know Tony, and you really don't know me, and you might not know Neil. But I was a young kid working here at Raceway Park. I had a five liter Mustang. But actually, before I had my Mustang, I was a huge fan of Cars Illustrated. Now wait, wait. All right. We're standing right now on your turf. This was the this burnout is. area. And yep. he was the water guy. He used to spray, spray the water down for us. This was my domain, man. I loved working in the burnout box because as a drag racing fan, as a Mustang fan, you couldn't get closer to the action than standing right here. This was it. This was it. Ground so, zero in the best view of the house. Yeah, and I had no money. I was a poor college student, so I could barely afford to go down the racetrack in my 87 L. I had an 87 LX. I tried to duplicate what these guys did. So I think I came around the wall. I would drag race my car when I got a little break when they would say, all right, you got 10 minutes to go uh, eat some food. And instead of eating, I would hop in my car. I'd park it right back there with the hood up, with ice on the intake. Yep hop in the car and make a run. So one of the times I came around the wall and Neil was next to me and I couldn't believe the magazine guy was there. So I think I put the window down or something, right? Neil, I was just like, hey, yo, you're the magazine summertime. guy. I'm in the right lane, he's in the left lane. And I look over and I go, all right, I'm being recognized. Here we go, <laughs> questions. With two cars back from the ready line, I'm getting questions on how to go fast. His introduction to me was, yo, what'd you run on that last pass? How did you go that fast? What do you shift at? He used to grill us. I was so grilling every, these guys. Every, every pass we'd make. But, classic example, we went through this with everybody. I told him what I shifted at. Really? Everybody says, no, you can't shift at 5,500. I said, what'd you shift at? 52. I said, this pass, make no changes. Just shift at 5,500, it'll go faster than the last time. Really? Yes, really, do it. Ah, I don't know, everybody said, do it. No, did it. it did. It went fast. Yeah, because my very first pass down the track in that car was a 1464. And you guys had already been in the 13s. And I was so naive, I just couldn't imagine where, where am I getting six tenths from out of this car? And a lot of it was the driving. And that's when I asked you, and I want to say I went like 14.42 on the next pass. So I picked up two tenths just from shifting different. Right. That's and then, we discovered that street race. Yep. 50, 5,500 first to second, 5,000 second to third, and then fourth gear with the three-way gear. Just, just click it right before the lights, and that's where you get the... Yeah, and my car had 273s, so I was a little bit behind the eight ball, so I had to really work on my driving, and I had no money, so I really had to work on my driving. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Here, we are. Right? We are getting ahead of ourselves. So we got to set the, 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 the tone for this, because, Neil, what do we have over there? We've got my 87. Okay. We've got Freehold Dave's 85 Capri. Oh, but wait a second. We got... We got Hundreds of thousands of people are watching this right now, right. okay? And they don't know who we are or any of this. Right. Well, we're, we're going to introduce all those people throughout this whole okay. show. I think the gist of it was that these were dark times. The early 80s were dark times. Uh, right out of the Malays right? era. Yeah, I mean, emissions was in full effect, heavy cars, slow cars, and... Irox had 305s yeah. in them. Tape I, performance yeah. packages. The it Mustang 2, need I say more? Yeah. So Mustang guys were like, oh my God, we need something. And here comes this Fox body, first as a Fairmont, mm -hmm. and then as a Mustang with a V8, a stick shift, lightweight, rear wheel drive. It does burnouts, it chirps second. And then you two guys come along and show everybody in the world how to go fast and that these things can kick, basically kick the crap out of old muscle cars. Some of them that had big blocks for like $10,000, you could buy one of these things, which, you know, obviously everything is relative, but it opened the door and the eyes to the world of EFI. When nobody knew what these cars could do, it was, it was an innocent time because really, even though it was only 225 horsepower, which is nothing compared to the stuff today, but it, 
the world was the car the, the car right. was your oyster. You could still do everything to it. We didn't know that at the time. So you guys started doing these tricks and tips and skinnies and pull the front sway bar off. And the car started going from 14s to 13s to 12s, put a tire on it, you broke a trans, you found the weak link, and you hopefully you got it warranted, which I did a few I did. times. I, I did. Didn't. I did. Yeah. Third gear, right lane, third round, heavy illuminator on a Sunday. Crunch. I oh, was yeah. just about to win money. They, I think they called me All the right. T5 bandit. But so so the, so you look to the to the 70s where you know the cars basically sucked. And then the early 80s, which, okay, an 82 GT or a Camaro, they came out. And then the Grand National, of course. And it was also the rivalry because you had the IROC or the Firebird. You had the Grand National. You had the Mustang. So it was like those battles from the 60s, I would imagine. I'm a little too young to have owned, you know, one of those cars new. But it was an exciting time that, that just got exposed by you guys. And that's really, I mean, that's how this whole thing kicked off. And it really kicked off right here at Englishtown. This was it. This is, so let's do this. Let's go sit down, right? We have some other people with us. And let's tell the story about how you and I got together and how we ended up with the, in, in this whole Mustang thing. You know, because you were a Chevy guy. I was a Mopar guy. Yeah. And for some reason. Big blocks. <laughs> big Four. blocks. Big blocks. Big yeah. four speeds. We met in the dark on the street through a mutual friend after cruise night when no street racing was going on save it let's go sit and down. all we did was to, we bonded over torque torque and we ended it's up with five torque of the other matters cars. we ended up with five of the other cars with a five speed and 308 gears you and i stood exactly like this you were here i was here we were in the spectator side lanes at atco that sunday okay after you got your car on a wednesday we, we had it sitting there cooling off, and you said to me, what are we going to do with this thing? And you kept going, I said, what are we going to do with this thing? <laughs> right? And I kept saying, I don't know. It's like, it's a regular engine, right? I said, we decided before we bought them, it's a push rod engine underneath a really weird looking intake. We just got to pray that all the horror stories we heard about how the computer is going to stop us from doing anything, that, that they're all That was false. the thing. This was, like, this was science fiction. This right. was like out of the future. We thought that computer box in the kick panel was going to kill us and that we were never going to go fast. No, right? I knew we were going to master this. I just didn't know how. So you went out and you made a pass. I don't remember what you ran. You ran a 14-something, right? You came back. You were like, okay, you got to drive this totally different than any other car I've ever been in. I'm like, yeah, we've got gator backs that are basically like rocks. We've got a 335 first gear. It's got torque out the wazoo as soon as you roll out of the clutch. Well, okay, so you got to realize, right? up to this point, my whole life was B-body Mopars, big blocks, and four speeds. And it, it's a completely different animal. Those, that, those cars, you have to, you know, hey. blast. Yep. You know, there's all kinds of violence involved in running those cars. So my first, the first time I got into one of these things, I tried to drive it like I drove, actually like, the first time like I drove one of these. GTX. <laughs> okay, the first time I drove one of these cars, let that plane go by. The first time I drove one of these cars was yours when you picked it up. And you brought it by the office. We worked for Cars Illustrated Magazine. So he brings it by the office. He just picked it up. I get in the car and I'm gonna go around a block with it. So I'm thinking, drive it like a Mopar, right? You know, it's a big giant pistol grip. And so I get around the block. I go to bank second. I bank second and I broke bolt bolts off the ship. Remember that? Right? Yeah, I did that one we, night street racing. Yeah. yeah, a bunch of us did it, but the problem was they were metric bolts. Yeah. And we didn't know anything about metric bolts in 1985. Right, this is 1985. We knew they existed. We had heard the numbers. We didn't know the correlation. It took a while to go to like the hardware store and figure out how to put bolts in it. So I did had to put smaller bolts in it to hold it. And it was. Did you think you around. broke the transmission? Because I did when it happened to me. No, I I pulled up in front of and back in front of the office with the holding the shifter out the window. And I was like, Neil, I'm sorry, I broke your fucking car. Listen, don't worry, <laughs> don't worry about it. I once broke the drive shaft on the highway after leaving here one night, driving back home, and blew the shifter completely out of the transmission and it landed on the passenger seat next to me. Keep nice going work. on. Tell, tell them how we okay. came up with the so, 10 minute tune up. All right, so before the second pass, we're cooling the car down, we're in the lanes, Tony's still going. Okay, it ran what it ran. What do we do now? I'm like, I don't know. So he goes, Well, what about that thing? And he's waving his hand at that thing. He meant the airbox over the filter. I was like, What about it? He's like, Well, if it was a four barrel, we'd flip the lid over or take the air cleaner off, right? So if we open out, we'll get more fresh air. So we pop the clips. We open the box a little bit. Not that easily because this is brand new and stuck. But anyway, you get the idea. We open the box a little bit. Filter sits right in here. Well, we took the filter element out. We, uh, eventually, we took the filter element out. Um, made another pass. 
it picked up a little, probably picked up a little bit of mile an hour. Really, all the ET was in the launch and actually, actually shifting it as hard as you possibly could. We had a lot of arguments and a lot of conversations with people <laughs> about between granny shifting, speed shifting, which is almost power shifting, and driving it like you're trying to grenade it on the first pass. And if you drive it like you're trying to grenade it on the first pass, it's going to go fast. And then every time it doesn't grenade, it's going to go fast. Well, no, pass. see, now when I when I first tried to drive these things, it was it, it was a disaster. All I did was just spin through first gear and then and then you know yeah. get squirrely in second. Second gear. And then I realized, and 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 the the slower I, I the easier I left, mm -hmm. the slower I came off the clutch, and it came to the point right that I was getting my best times with the, with these cars. Literally just swapping feet. I wasn't building any like on a, on, a, on when I was used to driving. You bring up to 3,500, 4,000 RPM and mm -hmm. just aggressively come off the clutch and and, right. and this thing was like literally from idle, just swapping feet. And you'd feel it. She'd she'd lean back. You knew. I had the launch on these cars. I, I made so many thousands of, of <laughs> launches with these cars that I could tell you to the hundredth what this thing was going to clock before. The car actually rolled out of its own oh, yeah. rollout. You know what I mean? It's just like before that tire went one it. revolution, I could tell you to the hundredth what it was going to run. And basically, if you had two seventy threes like I did, you needed to get <clears throat> you needed to get where you got that perfect little ee -ee of the tire, like right. it was almost going to give up and spin and blow off, yep. but it just it tweaked and spun a little bit, and you were like at that point you were like power shift second, you're like, please let me hit third, because this is a good run. Yep. And if you, hit, you went through in third with, uh, with uh, 273s, and you knew that that was going to be a good one. And, and on the power shift thing, like he's saying, I remember reading you guys power, I didn't even know what that was. We did a, <laughs> you know? we did a story, we had a sidebar on how to sit, sitting up, oh. you couldn't lean back, you had to sit up straight, sit yeah, close, you to, be up on the close wheel. to the wheel, getting leverage on the clutch. It was total science. But I remember yeah. the first time I did it, and I couldn't believe that I was going to try to shift this car, which I'd never done before, with, flat with my right car. foot. You know, basically trying to press into the header, and so I think I did it at about 3,800 the first time, just to try, just to try it. And I went through the gears, and it obviously it bogged, and it didn't go. It was like on the street, um, but I was like, oh my god, like the motor just woo. Mm -hmm. And I was like, every I know I don't think I ever shifted at the track without doing that. And obviously, so thank you guys for letting me blow up my trans a few times. These things are small. Ford small blocks for decades have gotten a bad rap. They don't deserve it. They're efficient. They're compact. They make power. The ports on these heads are just the right size for a small torque. motor. Yeah. You wouldn't think torque in a 302, but the, it's the got combination it. of the runner intake, runner intake, intake manifold, intake, runner intake, the heads. small ports. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And then that transmission, the T5 transmission well, with the 335. Being a Mopar guy, I mean that's that's a cross ram just in one direction. Exactly. Exactly. You know? No, it, it's tuned. Ford, I mean, they, they just hit it they got dead roll on cam. the money with this thing. Yeah, everything was perfect. I had never, up to that point, I had never experienced anything that made so much instant, just the bottom The response go. was amazing. Right, mm -hmm. it was, right. And that's what took me so long to get used to it. it was, it's a curse on street time. How did, so how did you figure out then about the um, swap in the belt for a 70 and a half inch belt? I that, remember that number. That stuff took a little time, and actually the 70 and a half inch, belt, the short belt deal, was really stolen from Steve Collison at Superstock Magazine. We'll talk about Steve in a little And we're going to get to Steve in a, in a little while. we got some people here who are going to talk about Steve. We're going to tell some stories about Steve. Uh, Steve was an integral part of everything that happened here on the East Coast with 5 liter Mustang. <laughs> Steve's hatred for me was an integral part. Yes, it was. I mean, we the, later on, we became really good friends, but for a while, we were, yeah. The rivalry we had, you called it, a, I call it a personal rivalry between the three of us, although it was more of us against him. He was the big time magazine guy. We were the little freelancer guys working part time to, to make, well, you were on the staff originally and I wasn't, but we were making payments off of our paycheck and we didn't have a budget. He's getting parts and we're scratching. He, bought, he got his car for a dollar, for a dollar. and mm -hmm. they kept funneling right. parts to right. him. Right. He got a manufactured car for a dollar. We went out and bought our cars and made payments. Steve used to, so Steve was, he was a Southern California guy, right? So he transplanted to New Jersey. And in Southern California, bud, if somebody calls you bud, right, that's slang for asshole. That's, that's yeah, Southern that's California speak for asshole. So anytime I'd be at the track, you know, whatever I happen to be doing, I'd hear, hey, bud, right? And it was, it was Collison. <laughs> you know, it was just calling me an asshole. Yeah. He so. literally, he literally flipped me a roll of film in the tower and said, have at it, kid. That's my first opportunity to write for the magazines or shoot for the magazines. Yeah. And it happened right out here in the dark. In the dark, at the yeah. bracket nationals, because he wanted I, to go home. 
I should just say, yeah. though, afterwards, you know, years afterwards, probably 10 years after this, Steve and I became really good friends, and I started doing a lot of work for, for Super Talk and Drag Illustrated, and uh, he was, you know, uh, the guy was just the best automotive journalist in the world. He brought out the best of me, and, and the best work I ever did, I feel, was in those magazines, but they're, they're gone. I mean, it's, no, the magazines are gone, but Steve's memory's not gone. No, no, no. Steve, Steve was a little guy at heart. He loved sportsman racers and sportsman racing. He understood cars just enough. He, he could drive, like, like as good as anybody in flip flops and yeah that's what's my what do I always say my famous phrase <laughs> only guy I've ever seen power shift in flip flops he'd take me out to lunch and power shift the uh, the press car he was driving that day right it could be like a six cylinder or four cylinder turbo <laughs> car and he's out there in his flip flops after we went for Mexican food and he's just banging gears doesn't lose a flip flop doesn't miss a gear but during during this period of time this was like this is early on like the summer of of 87 when we were hot and heavy with these cars. And Collison had been going like, you know, a little bit faster than we were going at the time. And I said to him, you know, Joe, I wonder what that car would run. I was being an asshole. I, was like, I wonder what that car would run if you really knew how to drive it, you know? So he says, well, you know what? Here, go ahead, hotshot, you show me. So I get in his car, this is at Atco. And uh, I think it was at Atco? Probably it had to be at Atco. Yeah. Yeah. It was before when there was still grass on the side. Yeah. So, I get his car, now my car had the stock long shifter in it, right? Now my car was stone stock, I never replaced that. All I did was work with the parts that were in there, where, where these guys were adding all different aftermarket parts. But anyway, that's besides the point. Steve's car had the, the short shifter, and I had never driven a short shifter car before. So I bang second, and then I go, and I was like, wow, that's, that's tight. And then I go for third, right? And when I when I punch third, right? Yeah, exactly. My hand went off the shifter, and my my thumb hit the dash, and it actually broke my thumb. And I'm looking at my thumb like this, pointing back at me, right? And I, I got two wheels off into the grass, and then I thought, you know, I hadn't lifted to that point, so I got to finish the run, right? So I banged fourth, and went through, and I went crooked, and he did it in his own car, and. I, with a broken thumb. With a broken thumb. <laughs> and two, Steve, two tires in the grass. Steve was, you're competitive, you're competitive, we're all competitive, right? Um, I like to think we have healthy egos. Steve was a competitive guy. Yeah. And when we were at the track together, he always wanted to race me. And I'd be like, dude, I'm trying something. I'm trying different <laughs> wheels now. I'm trying, I'm like, I'm not, I'm not in, a, in a racing mode. He's like, no, no, come on, run next to me. So I'm not looking at the tree and he'd leave on me. And But every once in a while we would race heads up. And even though his car was a little faster than me, when I, when I was focused, it happened here. We did it here that day when we all got together here that day. We're going to talk more about that day later. I beat him on a tree. I beat him with a slower car. And he wasn't happy, but he had the biggest smile on his face. And he congratulated him. He was like, that's a great run. That's the kind of guy he was. He wanted to kill you I, on the drag strip, but he I loved all of us. As, as humans and as riders. Hey, we're going to we talk about Steve later, and we're also going to, we found Steve's car. Uh, and we're going, to, we're going to talk about the actual cars in a minute. Um, but just finish yeah, real quick, finish the 10-minute tune-up. All right, basically the 10-minute tune-up is putting more timing in the motor. Engines like timing, Turn the it makes more power. Old school. Now, I don't know if we can see it, Catherine. The spout take connector. A, take, a, take a look. Where the heck is hitting over here? Okay. It's, spout connector. Yeah, the spout connector's folded back. Oh, it's taped. All right, right here. This little connector, you, you pull this little gray thing out and it gives you base timing. And then that's how you set your timing. You put the spout connector back in it and then the computer will add timing for total timing. So now, there was a big controversy back in the day because I always ran 16 degrees initial in my 87. You even wrote in one of the magazines we did, I just saw it the other day, we were going back through old issues. Um, it was just like a little tips thing we were doing. It was kind of a recap of stuff we had done over the past couple of years. Right. And you specifically said, for whatever reason, it's a mystery in Van Opry's car, it likes 16 degrees. Some only like 12 or 13, maybe 14. Mine wouldn't take more than 14. Right. Mine was 13. But here's the thing. 14 was the number on mine. Right. But we were using the stock balancer. There aren't good markings on it. I got cute because I couldn't see very well, right? So I went and got a Mr. Gasket timing tape. But at the time, they didn't really have a specific tape for this balancer. Right. So I put a small block forward timing tape on it. And who knows if I even got top dead center on true top dead center. So you I could have been, been I could have been running 14 the whole time. There were times when we even ran 18. I've got a buddy right now and you're gonna see some of that stuff Wait, on our channel. You're off. Let's Run finish let's finish because yeah. they, they want they want to see the 10 minute tune up. So timing, you gotta figure out what works best for you for your car. Um, unplug the coolant temp sensor. Yeah. Now the coolant temperature sensor right over here in the hard line right here, we would just unplug this clip 
and the computer would go full rich. We mostly would only do that in the winter time because obviously in the summertime you really don't need to be adding any fuel. And we would also unplug the fuel yeah. pressure regulator. We would, we would we would buy we would bypass, bypass. these hoses. It's, this is he barely ran this car to, to park it over here, and this is hot. We would take off both hoses, put Run a piece of brake line tubing. over I here. I used to yeah, run tubing yeah. underneath. Yeah, mine was sitting right over on the yeah, top. Yeah, these circulate coolant through the throttle body uh, plate for drivability. And all you're gonna do is but heat the air coming in, and you exactly. want the coolest air. You want maybe 100 degrees air temperature going in there. Yep. Um, and then, well, the big thing was was the belt bypassing the power steering pump and the air pump simultaneously by using a 70 and a half inch belt. All you had to do was lift up the uh, tensioner here with a screwdriver or a small pry bar, pop the belt out, you get the shorter belt, you would just snake it up off the crank and you would bypass these two pulleys right here and you'd pick up two tenths in two miles an hour. Yeah, I never had the luxury. luxury. You're less than 20 bucks. You're buy, bypassing buy the belt. power steering and the air pump. But you see, I didn't have the luxury of doing that because you, I didn't have an AC car. You didn't have an AC right. car. So you all my passes were made with the power with steering. With the power steering. And they, I don't think when we first got our cars that they were selling the uh, the brackets where you could have the pulley. You could right. put the plate that was after with that the pulley. Right. Did you guys ever try it with the belt completely off? Like get the motor ice cold and just try it? Yeah, but, you know but, belt. What's, but the problem with that is then it doesn't charge the battery and then the computer doesn't like it. Mm. I, I think I tried it I tried it like that once or twice, but I, I screwed up the passes uh, in other ways, you know? I did that on some press cars that we tested along the way, but it was good for like one, you got one shot at it. Please, do you remember that turbo or the, the, the supercharged T-Bird that we ran over in Milan yeah. with the Ford yeah. guys? I was and thinking I, about that last time. I took time. the belt. They were going like 16 O's with it, right? We right. ended up going like, like 14 O. Uh -huh. Taking the taking the belt off that was the big thing. So then, well, they all thought we were crazy when we showed up, and then we showed them how crazy we were. The next move was ice in the intake, right? Right. I yeah. Was just, you know, say. Keeping well, on track with the. Uh, with I was the just telling tuna. somebody the other day we were talking about the old days of five liter stuff because this documentary was coming up, and I was telling somebody how all of us in our five liter cars in the spare tire well we all had a, a short length of a, a garden hose, especially here at Town, They have a really big yep. watering hole in the pits, right? And I grew up coming to watch the stock and super stock guys at the Summer National. That's how you knew and you were a Mustang baller. Yeah. You had your three foot length of hose. Yep. Yeah. I just took an old piece of hose from the house and, and I, you know, I cut the bad stuff off and I would just loop it around the spare tire. I even had a little Coleman cooler. I can't remember where I bought it, but it wasn't square. It was like narrow, rectangular, and tall. And it sat right behind the driver's seat. It fit in the front. I remember well, that cooler. Right? And I, <laughs> I used to keep my towels in there and I would pack it with ice. So that when I was in, the, I would cool the intake back in the pits, and then I would just start the car enough and roll it, get it up in the lanes. And when it was really hot in the summertime, I would just take the iced towels and I would just lay them right over the top, and we would just suck all the heat right out of the top of the intake, and it would really make a difference. I mean, I had an igloo going with mine when I wanted to go fast. <laughs> I mean, is there an engine under there, or well, is the it only, just 14 bags of ice? The only reason I didn't like to carry big bags of ice in a cooler in the car is because it added more weight to the car. And I wasn't going to add a couple of like right. a 10 pound oh. bag of ice or a couple seven, eight pound bags of ice because science, if it's heavier, it's not going to See, go I was a fanatic about weight with my car. I mean, when I say fanatical, I mean, I literally, I took every bolt out of the front of the car one time or another and cut it down to lane for it. I mean, I was so fanatical with that car. Every Saturday, I would get it up on, on, on jack stands, all four wheels, mm -hmm. and I'd get underneath and I would wash and wax the bottom of the car. <laughs> my exhaust system had more wax on it than most cars had on the, the top running side. running joke back in the day. Um, Tony drove a lot of street cars that weren't exactly pristine. No. But he he actually bragged to us that he was wiping the dirt off the front coils of his five liter Mustang with a rag. I, I was gonna give no I was no wind was gonna be able to catch any part of that car. Right. They sure were amazing times. But that's this the ten minute tune-up. Basically that's the ten minute tune-up. And obviously there was the driving we talked about coupled with that and some other things. Yep. Driver mod was everything too. You could do all that stuff and be a couple tenths behind the pace mm -hmm. if you didn't really know how to ram the gears or get the thing out of the hole. And then you got into the whole crazy of sticky tires. But a lot of us either couldn't afford it or didn't couldn't afford to break the car. So you kind of stuck with what you got and you just learned how to get the 60 foot time down. And that was a big part of going fast with one of these too. Like you said earlier, it's just learning how to drive the car. That, but that 10 minute tune up story that we did. Every place we went, that was, you know, oh, we followed this car, it did exactly what you, you know. Well, people still quote it these, these days. Exactly, the yeah. Internet, anywhere you go. 33 years it, later, they're still. It, it ran many times. I mean, Carlson had me redo it in Muscle Mustangs years later. Yep. Actually, technically. Oh, we forgot the thermostat. He, that's true, too. I had to drop the thermostat. Yeah. I, had a, I had a 160. Yeah, 160. 
I had whatever you guys had because I followed your rules to the T. Yeah. Well, <coughs> the Ford guys were really mad at us. The guys at SVO were really mad. You can't tell people to put a 160. It'll run too cold. It'll go into the open loop. It's going to run full yep. rich all the time. The Ford guys, the fucking SVO guys, <laughs> they were like, you know, we know you're lying. You know you're making these times up. You know, why is that? And because our cars don't go that fast. And that's, that's the truth. No, we true. were going faster than the Ford SVO guys with their own stuff. And you mean the SVO engineers, not guys who owned SVOs. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, the actual right. Ford engineers. Yeah. And then I would joke and say, you know, it takes a Mopar guy to make a Ford go fast. All right, why don't we go have a conversation with some of the people we've invited, yeah. and we'll get back to this stuff later. Okay, this is Dave, and it's pristine 89 coupe. He's going to tell us a little bit about it. Sure, the, this is an 89 coupe, uh, black exterior with scarlet red interior. One of the things about the 89s, if, if anybody remembers, is that it had an option to come with the standard sport seats or the GT articulated seats. This one has the standard seats. And pretty rare is the bittersweet pinstripe you have on here. This car has 1,500 original miles. Uh, it still wears the original gator backs. If you remember these, back in the day, these were uh, we burned all these up. Pretty good, but uh, but this this survived all those years. Those are original. I blew a hole in the sidewall of one of the rear tires on mine after only about oh, I don't know maybe a month doing burnouts here at Raceway Park. Right here, in the water box <laughs> on either side. Went to a Goodyear dealer on the way to the magazine office. And I said, "Do you think you could possibly warranty this tire?" And he looked down the back of my car, and I forgot to knock all the rubber off before I got there. But I had blown the tire out on the turnpike. I was like, "I got to go get a tire." <laughs> so take. Well, this car didn't do that, obviously. Um, yeah, it's all original. I mean, even no front license plate. Uh, a lot of those cars in no the day. No dead bugs in the paint. Yep, none. They were all good. I had dead bugs in my paint. Headlights are good too. Right. Yeah. But uh, a lot of a lot of cars were undercoated in the day. This one has a nice, uh, nice underside. So when we took them for racing and stuff, we always wanted them not undercoated, so they were nice and smooth and slick underneath. Uh, also, the first year for Mass Air on the East Coast. First air, yep. First, first year for that. That's exactly right. Um, Window sticker still on the car. It's, uh, you could get it for a bargain, thirteen thousand one hundred nineteen dollars back in the day. It was uh, it was a steal. I mean, this is what everybody wanted. The uh, the hatchback cars uh, were more plentiful, so uh, so these these notchbacks or coupes, if, uh, depending on how you call them, uh, were uh, were really popular. Yeah. Well, here on the East Coast, notchback is a very popular term. Yes. All the racers are looking for a notchback. The cars were much stiffer, so they do make good race cars of any sort, especially drag cars. And, and a lighter, lighter weight you reduce yeah. the hatchback and all the glass in the hatchback. It's a little tough There's in the no trunk way. when you're trying to put your fuel cell and your batteries <laughs> and all your other stuff back there and get enough weight back there for you to actually have good traction. But as a race car, you don't have all that flex that, that the hatch cars have. That's right. Oh, Dave, thank you. Hey, thank you very Thanks much. Thanks for bringing Appreciate it down. It. Um, see you. Glad you enjoyed it. Great. Nice. Thank you. Okay. Okay, we're talking with our old pal Bernie Golick here, retired from Ford Motor Company. The, uh, retired in 99. The Muscle Mustang's a fast forward answer man, some of you may know him as. Um, we met Bernie right here at Raceway Park at the end of 87 at the Cars Illustrated Bracken Nationals. Tony and I were match racing our stock Mustangs. We should have been working, but we were screwing around out on the track making match race passes all day. That was work. Well, yeah, for we us it was work. That's the way we worked. We didn't get paid much, so we, we didn't do much right. work. We just <laughs> screwed around and made as many passes as they would let us make. We would match race the owners here, me, Jimmy. Nash. Bernie was so. Bernie was nice enough to come over at the end of the day while we were changing our tires over by the food stand in the pits to see what the heck we were up to, and introduce us to a famous guy some of you may have heard of, Storm and Norman Gray. We won't get into right now what that all led to, but that was an exciting time. Um, I have a question, Bernie. Yes. When you came over to see what we we were doing. <clears throat> What did you think we were up to, and what, we, what, did, what were you making of what we were up to? Here today? That when? day, that day or we that met you. that day then. When you, when you came up with Norman. Nobody was sold yet on fuel injection. Nobody was sold. There were still guys pulling them off and putting carburetors on. Yes. There was. A lot there of, was. A lot of our, lot there of was. Our friends. There yes. was. And <clears throat> I had proprietary knowledge of things that were in the fuel injection car, such as sequential fuel injection, 
which optimizes cylinder pressure. And believe it or not, we had engines that would develop a knock that were sequentially fired by a computer, and we had engines that were gang fired, also that they never knocked, but the other ones did knock. Sequential fuel puts the extreme pressure to the top of the piston at the right time while the timing is there. And I can just remember a long time ago, John Meany was with the Nickens, N-I-C-K-E-N-S brothers, and they were doing testing. And he said, our carburetors will make more power. We feel fuel injection is faster because it has that cylinder pressure that optimizes with the firing of the plug. In other words, so, fuel injector and plug at the same time. So basically, the injector had more potential for instant torque, right. where the carburetor had more potential for ultimate horsepower. Horsepower and torque was in the fuel injection truck. Absolutely. So now when we met you, our yeah. cars were running 13s. Did you know of any other 5-liter cars, stock EFI 5-liter cars running not, like that? Not even, maybe middle 14s. See, we were special. Yeah, we were special. Middle 14s and 86 came off a bad year. 86, that fuel injection was a dog. That's why we What was waited. the difference between 86 and 87? I thought okay, it was just the cylinder they, heads. Different cylinder heads, a flat top piston, no eyebrows, and what happened, they introduced what they call a high swirl combustion chamber. They put rings around, almost like choking the intake board in the cylinder head area. Okay. It they just screwed up. Trying to meet emissions, kill horsepower. So it was a one year only head, right? One year only head. And then the 87 that came out, it resembled the 85. Right. There is much, no, vir, virtually little or no difference from an 85 head to an 87 head. Right. 86 is by itself. You would think that the 86 head was off, off of a tempo. You just so you guys looking for heads? That's E5 versus E7 E5 TE head. E7 TE, TE head is 87 liter. Yep. But those E5 heads will work just as well. Just as well. Made for roller cam motor. And Where's my pal well. Dave? And they were. You got that story? Bring it over. Yes, sir. You got his story? Bring it over. The magazine. Oh, of course. Good old Dave. He's young. It's YouTube. Hard. It's okay. <clears throat> right, Uncle Kathy? That's right. If it's on YouTube, this it's is okay. four barrels of fun. Four barrels of fun, yes, sir. This is a story. Well, I wrote it, but we ran it. Well, we oh, ran yeah. it in that Mustang a, action. That was a big just, hit. Just one of the many magazines Tony and I invented that we made no money off of. Well, we did that to compete with Muscle Mustangs and Fast Forks. Yes, I think we did a fine job. Yeah. Um, we started both magazines. Was that a yes. periodic, though? Three months? Um, we did, I think we did a couple of these. Um, but this is Bernie and his son Brian. And uh, noted Holly carburetor expert Chick Pierman made a uh, made a jet change. Made a jet change. <laughs> <laughs> and I wrote a silly caption like I always did. No. Anyway, um, no. car was running 13? 13, 12? 8, 13, 13. 8. No, no, no 12. Yet. Okay. No, yeah, it was that. a while before we got down to the 12s. No, no, no. You let me drive it one time when it was in the 12s. But 12, people, got, you know, you really have to put this in perspective, now, right? Because today, a 10 second production car, like they're, they're all over the place, you right. know, 11 second cars. But you got to put yourself back in 1987 to run anything in the 13s. You got to have a big block. You got to have a big block. It's, you know, th that was a seriously category. fast street car. It was 13s, 429 Cobra Jet. But Bernie, I got to ask you one question, right? Looking back at that era, 1987, 1988, when, when this was the, the, the beginning. The beginning of this. What do you remember the most? What's, what was the most significant thing in your mind? You couldn't buy any parts. There wasn't a cylinder head available. Nothing until maybe 89, 90, when TFS came out. That was the first big explosion. You couldn't get heads. Nobody knew anything about cams. They went with roller cams, but nobody knew compression. They had no real track record on what it would do. All right, that's, that's from the technical standpoint. What do you remember is like the, the like, 
the the moment that this stuff really got when going. it got hot well it was the price of the car the entry level and then there was a little bit of a fight between a hatchback and a coupe and the hatchback afforded you the possibility of the car to put your tires in it and go to the track everybody here did exactly that the hatch there's still rubber stains right on the back of this seat in this car for me taking sticky tires right and, and, jack in it. and tools and going to track that, three times a week that alone was worth the price of a hatch even yeah. though the coupe was a little i'm going to say stronger because once you have a, a full roof pillar and the seal between the quarter and the, how would you say it the quarter panel and lower it's stronger in the coupe the coupe's a stronger car than that much stronger my car hatch. There's, there's a, there was a piece of molding over the over my shoulder right here, and I remember the paint being peeled, being scraped away about a half inch. Yeah, the cars would flex. Yeah, on a launch. Yeah, Coupe was a did. much better car. Yeah, every hatchback, right at the curve point of the hatch where the, where that body line goes this way, the paint wore off. If you drag raced your car, yeah. the oh. paint wore off of the body, and oh. there, yeah, so everything was twisting and stuff. It's like it's like a shoebox. If you take the lid off a shoebox, it's pretty flexible. Yeah. That's like having a shoebox. Okay. What you just did, that's what this car does. You drive it over 200,000 miles. You drive it all over New York uh -huh. City, all over the country. You drive it on every bad road in every state you can find. You drag race at every track you go to with it. It's gonna flex. Sure. This thing, I would drive it down the street on a smooth road. You could you could feel and hear the cowl shake. That's how bad. It oh is. yeah. Bernie Bernie is being humble too because. He knows so much more about these cars. I remember, uh, I'm gonna embellish a little bit. Um, so Bernie used to come by the office pretty often and have lunch with Jim Camposano, uh, former editor of Muscle Mustangs, and myself when I was a tech editor. And uh, of course, Bernie showed us all the great places to eat up in North Jersey. And he would always have a cool car, a Mustang or something like that. And I remember one day we, we go to lunch. This is part of the Bernie experience, by the way, because you experience Bernie. If you're uh, if you get to know him, you'll you'll get the Bernie experience, and uh, so <laughs> Bernie's laughing. Bernie says we can't go to lunch yet. I got to go to the Ford dealer, and we got I got to recalibrate a, a, a fuel Still system, a fuel good. system. So I'm like I'm geeking because I'm like I'm gonna get to watch Bernie, like update work a work system. update a fuel system. And I'm thinking he's gonna break out all this equipment and stuff. We pull up to the dealer. He runs in the shop, gets back in the car with a pry bar, a socket, and a hammer. We drive around the, behind the dealership. He goes, pop the hood, Evan. I pop the hood. He goes, come with me. Hold this. He puts the pry bar under the fuel rail, and he goes, just hold a little bit of pressure on it, not a lot. He looks around, he takes the socket, puts it on the uh, fuel regulator, whacks it three times with a hammer, or two times, whatever it was, and he goes, all right, let's go. I'm like, that's it? He goes, yeah, we just recalibrated the fuel system. <laughs> Car ran perfect when we drove away. It had a surge, had a rolling surge, lean surge, lean. And if you could raise the fuel pressure to the upper limits of the band where it dithers, if you could raise it to the upper limits on fuel pressure, you'll get a little leakage and over rich. Right, but those and are that's all the little tricks that you, I guess you just yeah. learn over over time you and how to make cars not just go faster but run properly. Yeah, and Bernie right. is just so good at that stuff, Diagno diagnosing engines and part. He knows every Ford part number ever created by man. What What happened in those years is that a lot of that stuff in the computer was very quote what they call proprietary, where only the manufacturers know what to do. But eventually, once they got inside the E4 and then the E5, which was programmable, then they opened up a whole set of worms. In fact, Ford Motor Company can develop any power curve they want on their own. They measure the power against reliability. Right, but so when you started messing with the five liter Mustangs, did you employ a lot of those tricks because obviously timing, fueling, all these things made the car Absolutely. go faster, but you knew a lot of that stuff already because you had the experience with the fuel injection. Neil and I, for about three hours in the afternoon in Rockland County, we were out with what they called a breakout box, reading, reading information, and we had two computers. 
we had a processor out of an automatic <clears throat> and a processor out of a stick. And we put the stick processor in first and we started reading timing as we were going. And what we learned that day is not a lot of difference between the two of them. What we did learn, Neil can remember this, is that the automatic processor, once it got into a situation where it had a little bit of timing or spark knock, it would pull the timing back. It would retard the timing with the automatic, and then it would come back up pretty quick. If you had a stick processor and the car went into ping, once that timing went back, it never wanted to go back up. The, the automatic processor had a fast recovery of timing once it retarded. And that's what we learned that This day. car won't run, but it's got one of those computers in it. Yeah. Automatic <laughs> processor. <laughs> I remember that being a big trick of trying to get a hold of an automatic. And, and was it an why? A9L or the computer code or something like that? Even before the a the, the automatic processor gave a lot of forgiveness with emissions. A stick car, they had a different table to follow. Automatic, right. it's a little more lenient. Push your converter slips. There's other drivability factors. So automatic processor in a stick car works. What you have to watch out is they have a neutral drive input button that you have to recalibrate when you do that. But it does work. That, that was the answer then. Automatic processor in a stick car. It let the timing come back. I wonder, do you guys remember when, when uh, like obviously 87 and 88 was speed density and then sure. the mass air came in and I think even again guys were once again like it was a whole nother being afraid of the car oh my god there's this whole new system that we got to learn and we got to try to figure out it ended up obviously being a way better way to go and you could do more to the engine drivability wise sure. I mean more drivability I had a cam in my speed density car and they would blacken the plugs at like every six passes <laughs> Blue, you know, that flare. Oh, yeah, you, you can't put much search. of a cam in, in a speed density. Idle flare. No, and I had, you know, what cam I had in there, that stock eliminator cam then. Right. <laughs> yeah, with tons of duration. Yeah. Yep. Oh, well, Lee can speak to that. Where's Lee? Where did he go? Where's Lee? There Lee, is. get in here. Wait, come over here real quick. Speed density. Mr. 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 11 second speed density. Hop in here. I know nothing. Here, you know where you're going. Here, oh. yeah, so jump whatever, in whatever I was told to do is basically okay. what I did, which but led people, to a lot of People success. still talk to me about the fact that your car ran in the 11s. Speed density. What, what Neil, it went 11.19 with stock injectors. That 19 was like, pound injectors. Same injectors in the right, stock yeah. motors. Same as any Mustang here. That Mustang sitting over there, that stock Mustang. That, that black coupe we showed you earlier. I think that was more of a... Uh, the budget affected the modifications at right. that point, but and how it much, just worked. How much, speaking of fuel pressure, how much fuel pressure were you running to do? Um, <laughs> evidently just enough, but I remember you taking the socket and a hammer while I was uh, <laughs> trailerless at Echo uh -huh. with a hundred and maybe a 90 mile drive home uh -huh. and wondering how far is he going to crush that regulator and am I going to be able to... Uh, uh, apparently I crushed <laughs> yeah. it just far enough, right? Yeah, I okay. don't remember how the car ran that night, but um, it pretty I, much... I, I, must, I must have learned the fine-tuning method from my yeah. pal <clears throat> Just enough. See, we knew enough at Ford to tell you what's taking place. We didn't know everything about how it made it do it because it was still very secret and they, they didn't want to share anything until the government stepped in and they made them put the connections in place and how would you say this this is proprietary information where everybody has to share it today so the reprogramming the reflashing opened up with e5 that was the answer e5 and prior to that the only one <clears throat> that had an erasable programmable chip was john meany remember that the chips first one first chip that he oh reprogrammed and he thought, John thought, that he had an exclusive on it and he had the patent rights to it and evidently he didn't. But right. It was the way to go. Programming. So this is how the evolution of, 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 of working with EFI before all of the technology, like people just whip out their laptop and do their thing. Right. Before this the is how all opened up. Yeah. There was, it was, this was this old was school. This was the infancy of it all, the first couple of years. But the thing is, he, okay, so these are nuts and bolts. 
right? But then there was the testing, and right. the testing, and the constant testing, and, that's and even more testing. And uh, some of these guys, why don't you tell a story with... Oh, All right, you want to want roll into that? You sure. want to roll into the, the day? I just gave you the introduction. There you go. Is that right. a test day or a right. drag right. day? Well, one of the main reasons we even started to try to do this documentary was because... Um, What's the date? May 13th of 1987? Yes, sir. That's one week after I, I picked this up at the dealership. Uh, it's about a month after Tony actually got his car. Um, somehow, some way, I still don't know how it all happened, but Tony said, listen, we got Raceway Park for the day. Um, we're going to share a rental with the guys from Superstock Magazine, Steve Collison, and we need to invite some guys. And we're going to go out. We're just going to make passes all day. I said, okay, I don't get it, but cool, I'll be there. Um, so we invited some of our local friends. Um, we're going to introduce you to all those guys. The only guy who's not here today that was here that day is Nitrous Pete Mazinski. He was supposed to be here. He couldn't make it. He sent his regrets. We were going to somehow we'll get him involved in this in the future. But um, our pals Freehold Steve and Freehold Dave brought Nitrous Pete, and Steve Collison came along. And the bottom line is, we went out on the track. We made passes all day long. I don't think anybody took any pictures except possibly Collison because he actually was the true journalist of the group. Tony and I were just two gearheads who decided to buy cars and try to write for magazines. We made enough money to pay off our cars and that's about it. Um, but this was so, a, a motley crew of street yes. racers. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> so, yeah, motley crew. I, yeah, I think, I think crew. even like before that, well after that day obviously with my car because I didn't get my car until December of, uh, of 87. but. I think I found like your guys' secret launch test spot over in Freehold, like that concrete <laughs> overpass. Yes. And I used to go there, and I think you tipped me off to it. And I would like go there, and like there was all these black marks, and I'd go there and just practice launches, like over there. It's somewhere in Freehold, Okerson. Okerson yeah. Road. There yeah. you go. I found the secret right test by spot. the railroad track. And, I, and we like we, a lot of us didn't even have tires back then, so you'd like you'd buy like a set of snow tires oh. and see if they worked better. Yeah. Like, you did all kinds of weird stuff that, like, today you just go buy a set of drag radials, but back then, you know, no which brand of snow tire is the softest tread, or, like, I tried all kinds of stuff to try to get, like, and you were all going to see the pants a lot of times because the track might not have been open, or, sure. it was really just everybody trying to figure their own car out. After I blew up my first set of gear backs, blew a hole in the sidewalls, um, and started buying cheaper reproduction, you know, replacement tires. Yeah. Yeah. I just started borrowing tires from everybody else that I knew that had tires. <laughs> you mentioned Tom the Chef. I borrowed his Pro Tracks. I, I, I borrowed tires wherever I could get them. Eventually, because we were connected to a magazine and we became big time, I was able right. to call and we actually got a couple sets of tires to do a tire test. He had to send him a query dirt tires that he, he wore down to the cords. Those Road like rocks. Road Star. Yeah, the, the road, they were called Road Stars, but they were actually road circle track road. dirt tires. Do you remember tread. the first time you put a sticky tire on your Mustang <laughs> versus the Gatorback? No! Uh, <laughs> no! It's all a blur. He's an well, all right, we were getting a little out of sequence here, but after he had gone 1370s on the Gatorbacks, which set the whole world on its ear, because that was impossible, that, was that couldn't thing. possibly happen. I um, went 1343 on Gatorbacks. No, you went to 43 on the, on the worn out McCreary's. Did I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Finally, I was like, you you insisted, I, got, I, I can't do it, until so you wore out the Gatorbacks and didn't want to pay for them. I said, I got your set of tires, put them on your wheels. So you, you, you ate them up in about a week or two. But you came down here. Every Gatorbacks Wednesday night were tough, man. Yeah. I Gatorbacks made one. Really I went 13.55. I remember one night I was working here, and I made a pass. And Jimmy Knapp, I didn't know he was going to mess with me. Put the, put it on a pro tree, so the tree just flashed, and I just ah, and I launched, and it hooked like harder than it ever hooked before. And I made the run and it went 13.55. I was never able, I don't even think I ran 13.6. The car was running like 13.7s at the time and I could never duplicate that run in hundreds of tries. That was the quickest that ever went, my car ever went on Gatorbacks. The air was right. Everything was perfect. Yeah, I, I, I never was able to do it again. It's amazing how fast that seemed back then and now. Right? Well, it's not I know, it's slow motion well we were talking earlier about how our first passes were 14s, 14.60s, 14.70s. Um, all right. But you got to understand how you, out. Steve, come in. you got to understand how we got so good at this stuff, right? Is that okay? So we were racing these cars literally seven days and nights a week. Oh. Neil and I here at English Town, you know, during the day, they'd set up the clocks and we would just have at it and go make one after one. And then we get together with these guys, 
And then every night we were off racing someplace. Oh like man. Global Docks in Mayon. And, 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 I mean, South it was very. Tom's River, we used to go down to Tom's River a lot. Double yeah. Trouble Road. Very unsigned. Yeah, Airport Road. Airport Road. Yeah. Airport Road. Yeah. Airport Road. Just Lakewood, went. yeah. Just went and raced. That's where I met Nitrous Pete down there. He, he had, he raced some dude with a Tunnel Ram Corvette. I think it was a white Corvette. And I was like, I couldn't believe that Pete, like with his stock looking LX, just blew this guy's doors off. And I was in awe. Well, these two guys, Freehold Steve, Freehold Dave, they're from Freehold, New Jersey originally, as you might imagine. Home of the boss. Makes sense to me. <laughs> these guys, this guy in particular, yes. got me and Tony into the whole five liter thing. Tony, That's not entirely true. Well, but it all starts with him. You you meet Steve here on a Wednesday night. He's, right in my Torino, right? Driving, big block Torino. He's driving his big block Torino. He hadn't gotten a five liter car yet, but Dave obviously had his Capri because it was an 85. Yeah. So we're geeking on his car. That's pretty cool. His big block Torino is cool. It's a big block Torino. It was red. What, what could be wrong with it? So Tony's like, I'm going to put it in the magazine, but you got to meet these guys. They're really cool. We got to hang out with them. Okay. So I come the next Wednesday night and I meet these guys. And who do they introduce us to? Nitrous Pete, but Nitrous Pete isn't impressed with us magazine guys. He's too busy running around in the lanes getting, getting his car ready to make a pass because he was probably street racing somebody later in the week. So he had his game face on and I don't think he ever actually looked up from the engine to say hello to us. He does that with friends too. Yeah, he's don't like, have to be a magazine geek. But. He's like that. If he was here, we'd be give, giving him a lot of crap too, even more, but he's not here so we'll go easy on him. So that's how we meet Nitrous Pete Mazinski when he actually had a Nitrous car. He got famous for having blower cars, but we met him when he actually had a nitrous car. So there was Storm and Norman? Right, Storm and Norman did, came later. But we didn't meet Norman until the end of 87. Yes. Now, we're talking 86 yes. when we yes. met these guys. Oh, right, okay. 86. 86 87. isn't over yet. It's like summer of 86. So 87 now, cars were off with 86. Right. So now, we're going street racing with these guys. We're at the track. We're at ATCO on a Friday night. We're at the track on a weekend, no matter where. Well, we would run ATCO, ATCO Friday night, and then when we are finished there, we'd go over to Philadelphia and run yeah. on Front Street. Yes. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yep, that was fun. So, okay, so, who got me into a five-liter Mustang? This guy. Who tried to talk me out of buying a five-liter Mustang? That guy right over there. <laughs> because, because my Uncle Tony, your Uncle Tony, he's worried about everybody's money, okay? <laughs> he sat me down. He gave me the fatherly talk about why I couldn't afford to buy a five liter Mustang, but I convinced him otherwise, and that made history. We were 24 year old kids. <laughs> yeah, I was 21. Yeah, whatever, 25, <laughs> 27, whatever we were when we were doing that. I mean, 25 when we were doing that, right? I'm a year older than you. So, all right, so we meet Steve. Steve's a bad influence, right? <laughs> he's a smart guy, and he can help you out with your car, but he's a bad influence. We'll get you into stuff you didn't plan on getting into. But wait, I, I got I to gotta tell the story about how I ended up, because, all right, so I tried to talk him out of buying the car because he had a Cheval at the time. He was trying to build it up. He wanted, you know, a, a solid street car. I had my Mopars, and he, he he's hell-bent. He's going to buy this Mustang. So you put the order in for your car, right? Yes. At the time, my daily driver was a 70 Roadrunner. It was a 3 to 3 four-speed. And I had a kid, and he was a baby, and we had the baby seat in the back of this thing. And it was typical New York car. The floorboards were rotted. I had, I had, I had headers and like you know just just cherry bombs hanging off the end of the headers. And it was you know I can't haul around my family in this car. So I says you know what? If Neil can buy a new car, I can buy a new car too. So I says at the time Yugos had come out, right? <laughs> if I'm lying. Thirty-nine right? ninety-nine. Yeah, right. So I says you know what? Let me go try a Yugo, right? So I pull in, and uh, they had one. I get in to, to road test it, I break the shifter. I, I, I had a thing, I broke a lot of shifters in those days, you know? Yes. You are trying to power shift a U, never, though? Yes, I did. Never right? a pistol grip, help. Never a pistol grip, because again, I was used to driving these Chryslers, and you gotta, you know, you gotta really manhandle them, so you try to do that with these other cars, and shit just breaks, okay? So, I said, no, you ain't gonna work. Then I says, wait, I'm a Mopar guy, let me just go get a GLH. I'll go get a GLH on me. I think they had just come out to GLHS. Shelby, right? yeah. Yeah, the, the, the Shelby, the Dodge so, Shelby. Yeah, so I went to the Dodge dealer. Goes like they hell. didn't have one for me to road test. That's what it's so saying. So I says, oh, yeah. mm, you know, and I'm one of these people, I, I run on like like instant gratification, like all primal urge and instant gratification. I need to buy a new car, I need to buy it right now. So as I'm thinking to myself this, a Mustang, a new five liter, eight, 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 it was 86, 87, doesn't matter, sitting at a traffic light, and this guy, and my roadrunner, and this guy pops the clutch and bangs second and gets squirrely in front of me. I'm like, oh God, I need that. I gotta have that, right? <laughs> so I went straight to the Ford dealer. And I sat down and I said, listen, 
I want I want a, I want a five liter Mustang. He says, leave everything out of it. He says, what do you mean leave everything out? I says, if I can have rubber floor mats, I want rubber floor mats. I don't want a radio. I don't want a cigarette lighter. I want nothing in this car. So he looked at me, he's like, and then, and then he started to get, get excited because he used to race a guy named Jim D'Angelo, I believe his name was. Sounds familiar. Whatever it was, he used to race speedboats. So as soon as like, I started talking that language, he was like, yeah, yeah, let's do this thing. So he ordered me the car with like zero options. And that's how I ended up with a five liter Mustang. It was like total spur of the moment. Because you needed a daily drive. I needed a daily drive. It didn't guy, last as a daily driver for very long. Both of these guys, they took me around in my three color 75 Malibu that we used to use as a tow vehicle to tow the trailer and tow everybody's car to track. But it was disgusting and it got no gas mileage and it didn't have air conditioning and the Mustang had all of that stuff. And I kept meeting all their friends and they were college age kids. And most of them were making their own car payments, working part time or going to college and they were paying 200 bucks a month, 220 a month for an 86 GT. Delivering like, pizzas. Yeah, they were delivering pizzas. And I'm <laughs> we thinking, delivered yeah. pizzas. We, yes, we did. We'll get to that too. Oh, okay. We delivered pizzas to help make payments on our cars. Um, <laughs> now, wait, now this is yeah, significant. Yeah, okay. You gotta understand, right? We were kids. We were the most underpaid automotive journalists in the business, right? But we were doing, we were living the dream, right? So part of living the dream is like living in poverty. So <laughs> we, <laughs> it still holds true to this yeah, day, right? It really does. So he and I got a gig delivering pizza at night. So we did these magazines all day, and then the nights that we weren't racing, the track wasn't open, we would deliver pizza with our with our with our Mustangs, and then we would. Do, we would deliver pizzas with every kind of test car we had. We delivered. We were the only pizza delivery people in New York City that had Detroit manufacturer <laughs> tags on our delivery cars. We moved Detroit manufacturer tags on okay. our pizza delivery. Yeah, cars. if we did a drag test on a car, you can guarantee that night we were delivering pizzas and calzones to somebody on Staten Island. Nice. Exactly. And then we go street racing afterwards. So, so how did that day go down, Neil? So, talk right, about the day, we, man. Just before we get to the day, the cow, the. the straw that broke the camel's back for me. When I said I'm buying a new car, I was working a freelance video job down in Camden, New Jersey. I get back to Hackensack, New Jersey at two o'clock in the morning. It's 22 degrees outside. I go into the parking lot with a wind towel and I get in my 75 mile before I turn the key, it goes click. I step out of the car and I start cursing at the top of my lungs. My voice is echoing off all the brick buildings of Hackensack at 2 a.m. and I'm screaming, I'm buying a new car. I don't care if I don't have a full-time job. I don't care if I have enough money. I'm buying a new car, this is bull. So, the following Saturday, these two gentlemen and somebody else, I don't remember who was with us, took me around in my three-color Malibu. We went to pretty much every Ford dealership we could find in central New Jersey, all around the track area, looking at cars. We went over to Dayton Ford. I was thinking about either a white GT or a gray one because all the kids that had 86s had those. I didn't like the way the 87s looked with the arrow nose and those colors. I'm like, nah, this ain't doing nothing for me. Dave disappears. Dave always would disappear. Where's Dave? <laughs> Dave's off in the, in the muddy lot with all the new cars in the back, right? All the snow had melted, so Dave's actually like skiing through the mud. So we all go skiing in the mud, and he's yelling, hey, I found two red ones back here. They're nice. This color, but with the, with the red interior, red cloth interior. I was like, nah, no good. But when I saw this color, medium Cabernet, I immediately had flashbacks to mid-60s Corvettes. Maroon. Tan leather interior. Honduras. And I'm thinking, I can do this for like 12 grand. I gotta do this, we gotta order one. Can you get it with a gray, with a, can you get gray interior? You can get tan interior, what, what, what can I get? I don't know if you knew at the time, but somebody said to me, yeah, I'm sure you can order it. We finally found a dealership willing to order it. So Steve drives me all the way down to Seabreeze Ford on the Jersey Shore one night. We meet this young guy, salesman, he's all cool. We're telling him about the magazine industry race and he thinks it's the coolest thing in the world. I'll order you anything you want. If it's on the sheet, I'll order it. He orders the car. We'll have it soon. Uh, soon. Okay. Didn't come soon. Anyway, it finally showed up. He comes to Staten Island, picks me up. I get my helmet, my timing light, and some cash. And he drives me back to Seabreeze Ford to pick up the car. And in his GT, 87 GT. Which is on the cover there. Yes. Yes. This car right here, this 87 GT, he picked me up in New York, drove me to Seabreeze Ford. We drove straight to where we are right now, Raceway Park came to the head of the lanes right over there, parked next to each other. I had 48.9 miles on the odometer, waiting to make my first Well pass. broken in. Yes, well broken in. <laughs> and they was nice enough to put Sunoco in the tank for me because they knew I was going to the track the night we picked up the car. Um, it's amazing how, like, probably most of us, this is the car that took us from carburation to fuel injection. Exactly, exactly. And we never look back. 
and well, every, look back. every race, look back. every <laughs> racer back. here that Wednesday night would walk by. They saw the two new cars sitting next to each other. And they saw us. We were standing outside the cars. Junior Canonical, famous Junior Canonical, walks oh, yeah. over and goes, "This is a really nice Mustang." He's like, "Whose car is this?" He says, "Mine." He's like, "Really? This is your car?" "Yeah, it's my new car. We just picked it up at the dealership." "Nah, no way." "Yeah, Junior. It's got 48.9 miles on the odometer." I couldn't make that up. Go look inside for yourself. <laughs> he sticks his head in. He gets out. He's like. Nah, come on. This is really your car. You're going to race your brand new car? I was like, why wouldn't I? <laughs> if I was on the street, I'd be banging gears and going crazy anyway, so I'm here to find out how fast it goes. First pass, 1474. We started putting timing in it before the night was over, went 1430s. That following Wednesday, we came here for that day, learned how to launch it, screwed around with it, messed around with it. It went a crap ton of 14.0s, flat, 01, 02, 03. Was Fin finally snuck a 1396 out of it before the afternoon was over. He had already gone 1370 in his car. And where's Lee? He disappeared again? Yeah. He disappeared. All right, he'll be back. Was this a 308 car or a 273 yes, car? No, 308. Both of our cars were 308. Yeah, both of our cars were 308 because we ordered them. And it was, oh, okay. a, it was a no cost option, so we ordered the 308. The big gear. The big gear. The <laughs> made, but it, it made a big difference. So there we were, going crazy all afternoon, making passes. And then we stayed that night and made more passes. Lee, get over here. I need you. Now Lee's disappeared. Come here. Oh, sure. The pizza showed up. That uh, Lee's eating. That's, that's the skinniest guy. The skinniest guy is eating. Okay. <laughs> so now, before that sound wall over there was there, there was just a fence. And Lee was always the first guy at the track. Yeah. Similar to this morning. First guy outside the gate. He, he'd Very knock timely. Off, he'd knock off work early on a Wednesday afternoon. And he'd drive down in his 86 Mustang to make pass. So he comes down and unbeknownst to him, we're all here making passes. And he's wondering what the heck's going on. And he's seeing the scoreboards light up, 1370, 1396, all these low 14s, and there's five, six Mustangs out there going crazy. So all of a sudden, we're over by the water box. I turn around, and who's hanging on the fence with his, <laughs> like this, with a big smile on his face, his eyeballs are this big. And he's smiling at me. Already like, plotting on how to. Right, and I'm thinking, I was like, holy crap, Lee's here already, it's like 3.30. I was like, why is he a soiler? Well, long ride, and he's always first guy at the gate anyway. So I, I go trotting over to, to see what's up. I'm like, what's going on? He goes, what's going on here? I said, well, we're doing a little magazine test. He goes, yeah, I can see that. He's like, whose cars are these? Mine, Tony's, Collison's, the guys. He's like, why are they so fast? I, said, I don't know, they're injected cars. We just learned how to drive them. We figured it out. He's like, I think my I, car was for sale. Not the next day, probably. Right. The next we, time we, I yeah. saw you, you were driving an 88 injector. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, implementing and we, everything you had discovered at that point. Right. And we won't get into the part where in between that day and the day I saw him with the 88, um, I got invited up to White Plains, New York to go watch some street racing. And who was cruising in the crowd? Lee in his 86, smiling at me. He's, come on, let's go, let's try it. And no matter what we did and how we did it, and I would let him go first and I would just roll up behind him. I'd always just go walking right past him. And he'd get frustrated. But well, just like we Brian sold another saying, car for four from that. So that, this oh, red car they, sold they were, many for yeah, I think yeah. Tony's car, my car, car, and a few yeah. of these other cars <laughs> sold a lot I, of other cars. I'm for thinking it. that the 86 car ran 15s. Yeah, it was. And they took them home. I had an 86. 15s all day long. I went 1440 in mine. Oh, nice. Stock. Okay. But that was murdering it. Slicks? No, Gator Bags. Wow, that's, that's good. Yeah, that's as fast as it would go. But I don't even think I popped the hood on it. Maybe I put a bag of ice on the intake, and that was it. That was it. All right, can I can I tell a little story? Sure. Quick aside. It, <laughs> um, one of the best thick car drivers around. But he didn't start out that way. He was a little shy when he started out. One Friday night at Atco, me and him, his brother Gary and his dad George, we all go down and meet. I bring all my stuff. I tell him, we're going to make your car go 12s tonight. And he's like... Are you sure? It's like, oh yeah, I'm sure. The air's great. It's October. You're going 12s. Uh, I don't know. We're going to do it. You're going to do it. All right. Well, I don't know how. I'm going to show you how. So he goes out. He makes a pass. He goes whatever, 1330 or something like that. Um, might have probably started around 1330. Yeah. Right? But and I was then, basically got to where Tony was right, and was right. stuck. And I, I gave you a short belt to try and it picked up a couple of tents and a couple of miles an hour. And meanwhile, at the time, what were you launching at? Like 2,000 RPM? Walking it out almost. Yeah. Just above that. Shifting it hard, but driving it out like he's leaving a toll booth or <laughs> leaving, leaving a stop sign. That's, that's how I was. That's, uh, 
Yeah. That but, was exactly how I learned how to drive well, that we were, car. Right. When, when you, you didn't have a trailer, that's how you. Yeah, but when you you get to a certain point where you just had to start improving the sixty foot, you had to launch it harder. You got to get that that you got to get that that weight moving, right? So I tell him, all right, you got to go out, you got to launch it harder. He's like, all right, well, what do you mean? I'm like, well, go leave it three thousand. He looked at me like I just told him to go shoot his dog, right? It'll never stick. <laughs> He's like, 3,000. I said, yeah, come on, you can do this. And his brother's standing there, and his dad's standing there, and they're smiling, and they don't want to give him a hard time because they're letting me do it, right? And, and like, I'm trying to coach him up. I'm like, you can do this, you can do this. And and it's the same setup now that they've, they've got the stands right over the water box. He pulls up in the right lane of the water box. I go, I go, and I'm watching him. He does a burnout, does good, right? I'm like, is he going to do it? Is he going to do it? Is he going to do it? He goes up. I hear the reps come up, pops the clutch, thing takes off, picked up what? At least a tenth. Right? I think he came real close to going into twelves on that pass. Right. So he comes back, he's all smiles. He's like, okay, you were right. I said, okay, next pass, you gotta leave a four thousand. <laughs> Why are you kidding me? I'm gonna blow this thing up. We're three hundred miles from home. But meanwhile, it's only like a three hour ride, it's not that bad. But he's like, no, you can do it, you can do it. Coached him up for a little while, <clears throat> finally convinced him, he goes out, pops the clutch, he's like, this thing's torquing up and leaving the line. And did it go 1297, 1299 yeah. on the 4000 launch? Yeah. yeah. I don't think we left harder than 4000 that night, but I no told No spinning? No, no I, I think it's. Didn't it have the MH's on it no. then? Or small, uh, small slick? I think it had a uh, MH at 265, oh, okay. okay. and it hooked. Okay. Yeah. So, with, with this collection of guys here, right, there's a lot of stories. But I'm sure each of you has one thing that stands out in your mind from that, like, that period, that 1987, you know. Let's go around. What is yours? Probably, uh, and looking at him for the first time in 25 years, is meeting him at the track and him being as crazy about street racing as I was. And uh, pretty much back then, in the 80s, that's all we did was either go to the track between Englishtown and Atco three, four, five times a week. And if it wasn't the track, it'd be street racing on the street, which back then was uh, not legal, but uh, it was absolutely done. And uh, so, yeah, absolutely. I'd leave the house at sundown and come home at sun up yes. and then go to work. Yes, absolutely. And uh, that's all we thought about. We all had part-time jobs. We didn't have full-time jobs. We barely made our payments on the insurance and the uh, car. But that's what, you know, so if we went to the track and the track closed at 10, then we went street racing until 2 a.m. You know, it was, uh, it was one way or the other. So, I mean, uh, I met him in a big block Torino. I transitioned into an, a 5.0 Mustang probably one of the first ones out. They came out in December of 86. We're talking about an 87 Mustang. And I had mine by February. Um, Tony, I think you've got yours in uh, March or maybe April, right? April. Yeah. And, uh, and then that's what we did. I mean, for, uh, by knowing these guys in 86. But question is, who won the first time we raced? Oh, uh, I don't know. Was it on the street or the track? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you don't remember? That's a good one. How many times have we fucking against each other? But again, you know, the whole thing with street racing back then was it's not who we don't want to, it was how close the race was and how interesting That's it true. was. We didn't have timers on the street. You know, it was just we wanted a good race. And if one beat us by, you know, five car lanes, that wasn't a fun race. It was more fun crunching gears and getting to the end, uh, that's the truth. that's why we all got along as well as we did, because we all had that same attitude. It yes. was like, look, I'm gonna fucking win no matter what, but right. I want a good race even more than that. Exactly. Know? And every time we did it, it was good. It was like, let's do it again. Or yeah. one of us would do something to one of our cars and you'd kind of want to get beat. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, yes. you know, because it's, it's like, you know, yeah, look, he stepped up. That's good. Now it gives me an excuse to step up on top of that. Two things about these guys that I always remember. One, when we first got started, I was talking before about how our competition was with, you know, the big name magazine and, and the magazine guy's car, right? So he was my spot. So when I was home, I was at Echo. Um, he'd be over there chatting up Steve Collison, spying on him because the magazine guy was always one step ahead of me. And he always had some other new part or some new modification. And he'd call me up back in the days when all you had was a phone on the wall in your kitchen. No cell phones, no nothing. So the next day... Touch tone my, was an option. Yeah. My, <laughs> my phone would be ringing. And I'd answer it, and he wouldn't even say it's Steve. He'd just say, you got to get yourself a short belt. Collison <laughs> ran two tenths faster last night and two miles an hour faster with a short belt. 70 and a half inches. Go to the auto parts store right now. And he would just hang up the phone. Right? So he was my spy. Go. How do you think I kept up with Collison? I didn't know what he was doing. If I couldn't be at the track, this guy, he would be my spy. And he'd film me on whatever was going on. That's how I kept, that's how I was low budget. And I kept up with the guy with the magazine car. And, and I still remember to this day, Gates KO60705. Exactly. That's what I had to do to go to the parts store and get that belt. And that so, gave you two to three tenths. 
That, that parasitic drag, what caused all that horsepower? Six ribs, serpentine built, 70 and a half inches. And exactly. they were nice enough to take me to Double Trouble Road to street race all the time, because they wanted to match my car against all the Grand Nationals they knew and everything. <laughs> so they bring me down to Double Trouble. I'm not paying any attention. It's a two lane road with no lights. It's in the woods. It's right next to the Garden State Parkway. There's a guy sitting there in a black Grand National. They say, go race this guy. So I pull around, not even thinking, I'm on the wrong side of the road, right? There's two kids off in the woods on their knees these two brothers, they had a big VHS camera they used to shoot all, all the street racing stuff. So, talk about good races, right? You guys were there, Nitrous Pete was there, and they were like, you gotta show this guy how to, how to drive. Well, he's got a Grand National, it's probably faster than mine. All I know is, every race, door handle to door handle, and every time I would shift, the car would jump and almost like go over into his lane and hit the car, and I'm just trying to steer, not hit the kid in the weeds. And after about six passes of us doing this, and it's like, you know, dead even, but I'm basically winning all of them, I'm coming back, Pete's all puffing his chest out. He's like, look at you, beating all the Grand Nationals. We come out. I'm like, why aren't you doing this? Good? I ain't street racing on the wrong side of the road. I was like, holy crap, I've been driving in the road. If somebody came down the other way, I'm going 100 miles an hour. What do I do? We were That's oblivious. Right. Yeah. We were anywhere, anytime. I was, anywhere, I was having anytime. a blast. And that was more fun that. than coming to the track. The track was cool. Getting, getting ETs was cool. You know, always doing better than the last time, the last pass. But that's that's how we did it. And what, are, what are your thoughts yeah, on it? I, I remember the street racing scene before the drag, the drag strip scene, and of course, brother at GR Steven hooked me up with you guys, and the vivid memory is, we're going to Bayonne. I don't think you said Bayonne at the time. The global docks. <laughs> yes, global docks. And I go there, and it's like, I'm on Mars. I've never seen this place, it's so dark. And here, here are these guys getting ready to race. I think it was our friend Tom Chef. Chef was there. Yes, and that and was when we went to get street racing photos of your car to use That's in the it. magazine. And he's the starter. And, and that was it. I, you said, can you start the race? And I said, well, I've never done that before. All right, I'll give it a try. And then after a while, I tend to like it. I said, you, you. And then you see the picture. I'm going like this in full, <laughs> full stride. No flashlight back then, right? The best no flashlight back then. That night, most guys didn't realize we were actually on a pier in the harbor and we were racing towards the land. The it was oh, so land. dark. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, okay. There's, we there's were in the, the shadow of the, the Liberty Statue Insurance Liberty. commercials, where they show somebody they, they they're talking and they've got the back of the Statue of Liberty behind them. That's exactly where we used to race. That was at the Global Box in Bayonne. Yeah, that's that's the lasting memory of street racing, and other than Staten Island and parts in Jersey, you said that was kind of that first phase with our cars, and then a vivid memory from the track. Uh, thinking of today is a pretty hot day. When we started going to track, we wanted to run our cars. Weather was not an issue. We would go in any weather. I remember here for AMRA event, we was, it was 100 degrees, no kidding. And we were running our cars. I don't know how we all survived. And that happened a lot of times. And then I remember vividly going to ATCO on the, I think it was maybe Tuesday nights. Or, in or, the snow. Or in the snow. I, yeah. Snow we were, was coming down. In the snow, yeah. yes. And we were running. Well, we still had traction. It was. It wasn't slippery. It yet. didn't matter. We yeah. both had no traction. Right. So we raced in the rain. We raced in the snow. We raced in January yes. or December when the tracks were open. Twenty-one when we degrees. We went raced on the street right. anyway. Yeah, and that those are. We kind raced of when it was one hundred and two. We those raced. are our two I memories. Mad when the roads were wet and I couldn't go street racing. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's how crazy it was. So what do you remember? I I remember most of the stuff from Akko because that's where I'm from. I live like eight miles from Akko, and that's where I met Steve Collison one night down there in my 85 carbureted GT. And uh, we got lined up and we took off for a race and he, uh, he, had a, uh, he missed a shift going into third. So I ended up winning the race. And that was when all these fuel injected Mustangs were showing up and I have my 85 and I'm like, wow, these things are pretty fast, you know, right out of the box. And, you know, I got some work to do here because this guy was right next to me until he missed the gear. And uh, so we get back after the run, we go, I drive back to the staging lanes and he pulls in behind me and he introduces himself to me. And we probably we sat there and talked for at least an hour until our lane moved again to make another run. And I was like, well, we're not gonna race each other this time because we're in the same lane. So whoever we get, we get, but it was, it was nice race again. I'm sure we're gonna race again. And uh, so he, he, he told me where he lived and I told him where I lived and he was five miles from the track 
and I was eight miles from the track, so we were both real close to the track, and we were both down there a lot, so we met each other down there more often, you know, a lot more times after the first night we met, and, uh, but he wanted to know what I had in my car. That's what he wanted after I, after he missed the shift and I made my run, he came back and he wanted to know what I had in this carbureted car making it run, because, you know, he, he knew about the carbureted stuff, but he was concentrating on, you know, on these EFI cars to get, you know, finding out what made them tick and what made them run, and he was getting a lot of little parts and pieces that a lot of other guys didn't seem to have at the time, and, and uh, his car seemed to run pretty good, and, you know, I used to go down there and shoot a lot of uh, video when I go to the track I'd bring my camera most of the time and you know if I wasn't running I'd shoot video or if the car broke I'd spend the night the rest of the night the grandstand shooting video of anybody and everybody that was down there but a lot mostly a lot of the Mustangs and you know my friends and all you guys when because you, you guys showed up down there that's where I met you guys right. and up at Maple Grove in 89 yeah. that was the first year I went up there. Sure. Yeah. Roll your memories of hanging out with us when you were just a kid. The two troublemakers, <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> I was always a little Why younger. Troublemaker? What? Just you were like in diapers. Just because <laughs> I adopted you when you were three and I taught you every part on my mini bike and of course. corrupted you at a young age so that we'd have a I remember Tony vehicle. getting the black stripper, the famous stripper car, the Mustang. And then him, oh, I got a Mustang new toy. And here I am, just about to turn 17. I want a new Mustang. What were you driving at the time? The famous 71 Cheval. Where'd you get that Cheval? Green one, right? The green yeah. one. You remember I that? Remember. You know how he got that? You remember how he got that Cheval? He walked in my speed shop one day. He was sitting out in the parking lot with no motor transit because that motor trans went in the shop truck. And I handed and it over the counter. I got he the came keys. in after school and I handed him the, uh, the registration to the Cheval. I said, here, this is for you. And he looked at me and goes, what is it? I said, this is the registration of the Cheval. He goes, what for? I said, because it's yours. He said, you pay for the tow home and the car is yours. That's what we did, believe it we not. call the unknown tow truck company. <laughs> is that Van Eider's thing? Uh, no, it was my own shop. By the way, that's how Neil and I know each other. He owned the speed shop. We were kids. How old were you? Yeah. We were in the 20s. Yeah. Mid-20s. He owned the speed shop, and I was a mechanic. So we, every once in a while, I'd do some work for him, and then we got tight. Well, then I know, went off to do the magazines, and he followed I, me. I went to college. I got a degree in film and television. There was no work. So I ended up working <laughs> at the local speed shop, and then I said, screw this, and I went and opened my own store so I could lose more money than I made. But now you're going to be a YouTube superstar. I'm, I'm planning on it. I'm planning on it. And I'm Who's, taking all of these guys with me. We're all going back to street racing. Yeah. 30, 35 years later, we're all going back. So, no, I how, how did you get your new car? Well, went home, told my parents, I want a new car. What kind of car do you want? I want a Mustang. Just like Tony, just like Neil. Oh, no, you're not. Oh, yes, I am. One thing led to another. Well, if you could come with the down payment, you could have the car, we'll pay the insurance. Wow. Turn 17, down to the Ford dealer. I want a coupe. I'll never forget, you guys had hatchbacks, and I wanted a coupe. Yep. Got the coupe, and ever since then, it's and an your, addiction. And your car was an automatic. Correct. Which was great, because we had the sticks, and then we would hear things about automatics, right. you know, and we would try them out on your car. Yep. Yep. I got that, that bad boy to go in the 13s. AOD. Which was unheard of at which the time. Which was unheard right. of, correct. A 13 second AOD car didn't exist. Not in 1987. But uh, And the one thing about uh, these fuel injected cars uh, that uh, was so incredible, you would do so little to them and it would respond with great results. So, I mean, you know, you would do something like, uh, I mean, the first thing was the airbox silencer, take that out. Then the shorty belt, then the pulleys. Yeah, we did a whole segment on the, some on the gears. Ten yeah. So, I mean, yeah. It, you know, the 10-minute tune-up gives you almost a second. I mean, uh, but traction's everything. I mean, when we, we went to the M&Hs from the Gatorbacks, and you hooked, you launched the car, you know, 5,000 RPM. You know, that car didn't pull the wheels off the ground, but I'll tell you what, it, it improved by half a second. And uh, power shift in the car. I mean, you got these cars these days, you know, four, five, yeah, 600 okay. horsepower. They're doing it with horsepower. We did it with uh, just a little uh, old, old, old school finding hot rodding. Finding horsepower. Yeah, exactly. Basically, we find every one horsepower we could. Yep. Okay. <laughs> you don't know? Ford shootout, the first one? Yeah, we can go with it. Yeah. We keep going back to this issue. In this issue, uh, Tony's the editor. It says, why is a Chrysler guy like me doing a magazine like this? Which was a recurring theme. Why is a Mopar guy doing... Right. Doing right. 
There's me I'm try, still trying wondering to do home head forwarding at home. No, no, no eye protection. It was, I wasn't actually grinding anything at the time. I probably hadn't showered in a couple of days because back then all we would do was think about cars and not actually shower. This, this one particular magazine, if you can find it anywhere, is full of all of these guys' cars. There's just Storm and Norman. Remember Storm and Norman across the eighth dimension? I drove, you, I drove that you, car the first time he brought it to the track farm. Yeah. You, you, know to, you did this story. You came back to the office. You were like, that guy's a trip. I'm like, yeah, I know. Got to do a story. Yeah, I know. But if you notice in the thing, it said 12 second. And 12 second at that time was unheard of. Yep. And then he eventually went on to the nines. And one time at uh, Maple Grove at a test and tune, I think he rented a track and maybe two others. I said, who let this uh, Pro Stock car in here? I mean, a nine second car back then was like a Pro Stock to all of us. Okay. Running oh, yeah. 12s, 13s, 14s on a 11s screen. was like going to the moon. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, but this it didn't take everybody long to get there. That's a famous AOD <laughs> story. <laughs> sure, Automatically, that's everybody right. I've ever I known with an AOD car parts will email me up, or text exactly. me. But it was fun going with there with that part. Oh, yeah. Stuff from this story. Two, two AOD cars going fast, which was unheard hey, of. Hey, speaking about AODs, Gary Rudder's here. Yes. Come yes. here, Gary. Okay. Thank you, Gary. Have a seat. Bud. Talk about fast AOD cars. I had the oddball automatic car. It was unusual. I loved it. I shared it with my wife. It was her commuter wheels. We'd go, but, to, we'd go to track rentals. He'd bring his wife's car. Yeah. And I'll tell you, um, I never ran it on Gator backs. It, I, maybe the first time out, and that was about it. So I always had good rubber. And it took some time, but that car ultimately went, it went 13, 19, which is really fast. And, and all um, you really did was put a converter in. Yes, that came next. Band. And what had happened was you, you knew somebody that made helicopter parts for the government in Philadelphia. Does that ring a bell? You're, you're thinking about Rennie Chartrand? He was, he was, a, he he was a, he was, he was a helicopter engineer for McDonnell Douglas in St. Louis or whatever. Well, he had a, um, a, a new shop, and it was uh, a new Are technology. Trans, trans specialties. I don't recall, but yeah, they're um, the ones who built your converter. He had a CNC machine, and this guy made helicopter parts, and was now going to delve into uh, converters for yeah. AODs. That was trans specialties. This so still around. Once I put that in there, the car went uh, went twelve ninety five, which mm -hmm. was fabulous, okay. and it was easy on the street because all it did was take a little creep out of it, and mm -hmm. it was pleasant out of light. It was totally well behaved. Nobody would even I, know it. I drove that car. If you touched the throttle with a hint of a hair of your big toe. It just picked up the front end and started roasting the tires. He let me drive around in the pits at Echo at a private rental. I was like, how do you drive this thing? He's like, it's great. I, 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 yeah, I know, but how do you drive this thing? How did you launch it, Gary? Uh, there there was, was a technique. There was a technique. Um, of course, it's not a good technique for bracket racing, but I would like to surprise the converter even when it was like bone stock and I would have my foot like way off the pedal and there's some video from inside the car and you could hear my foot actually slam against the pedal and that was my way of ambushing wow. a torque converter <laughs> you know if I can make that car idle at 200 rpm I would have I would have done that <laughs> action okay well years ago when I used to race uh, an automatic overdrive uh, five liter you had to um, you had Put it in, in first gear and lock it in and you'd wing up your engine up to like 5,000 rpm and you could shift it into second by just simply putting it to drive. It got tricky because you couldn't make the 2-3 shift be without the uh, pulling the shifter back yet again and that would be your 2-3 shift. So it was, a, it was a little tricky and as, and as the car got faster and faster uh, you had to be sharper and sharper to hone your skills to do that 2-3 shift. Is that okay? Okay, I have a question for Tony DePietro. You. You. No, wait. Of Mother wait, Mopar. wait. This is the, uh, people call me Tony yes. Mopar. This was the original Tony Mopar. You're like, what, two years older than me? Yeah, two years. Yeah, so like, he was he was the guy that I looked up to when I was like 13, 14. He was the guy that was actually starting to dig into motors and shit. So that was the original Tony Mopar. I, I think I was more tracked than you were. You were more into street racing. I was more into bracket racing and chasing points. And I was into street racing and I was into blown nitro. Yeah. And, and really nothing else, in, nothing in between kind of interested me. And yeah, but you, I know where Neil wants to go with this. So, but you were the guy who used to show up at his driveway, yeah. hang yeah. out and ask Yeah, he right. got hand tools and took it, so, learned it, and went with it. So he's your fault. Kind of, yeah. Right, like he's my fault. Yeah, I take responsibility. Got it. Yeah, but I got him when he was only three. So I really messed with him. 
Um, but I just want to know, you were at the Mopars for so many years. Yeah. You raced that Fury week in and week out, round after round after round. I never thought you'd get rid of that car. Somehow you got completely out of Mopars except for your Ram truck, which you just got. And now you got nice, multiple nice Mustangs. What's the deal with that? It started in 88 when my father retired. My old man taught me how to drive in a Corvette. He was a, a famous Brooklyn street racer in the 50s. Um, when he retired, he, all he wanted was a hot rod with a four-speed. There was nothing else in 88 except Ford Mustangs. And I was anti-Ford. I was a Mopar guy in the way. But we had no choice. So me and my sister chipped in. We bought him the car as a retirement gift. About using the 10-second the tune-up, uh, the 10-minute tune-up, yeah. we got him to go 1370s in that car. Right. Street car, he drove it every day. He loved it. Uh, about four years later, he had a stroke. I was racing a 68 Carnet RT at the time. Don't sell my car, Tony. I want to see you race my my car. So his car became my backup bracket car. Okay. When he finally passed away, how do I sell my father's car? So money got tight after the divorce. The Coronet got sold. The Mustang would never go anywhere. To this day, it's still in my trailer at home. It's a 10-second really? bracket car. I still race it. Love the car. But all the spare parts, you know, after a while, you have a block, you have a set of heads. You have enough stuff I to found build this, another car. I found a notch down in Maryland. We built another nice street car with a blower. And it just gets, now I got the 93 Lightning pickup that we're doing a stroke of motor for. It's like anything else, just like generating parts. I don't want three cars in the driveway that can't exchange parts. If I break something on one, I can steal it off another car. And the next thing I know, I'm, I'm a Ford guy. There you go. In fact, right. we just won uh, the NMRA event. That's we right, he won Ford Muscle at the NMRA. So, Ford Muscle yeah, yeah, fun with this week. And it's you can it. see all of that stuff on Stickman's Garage, my new YouTube channel coming up real soon. Now what? Tell us about Sick Man's Garage real quick, right. which is the newest member of the UTG network. Yes, it is. Yes. All right. Is. There'll be a lot of Ford stuff. There'll be five liter stuff. There'll be early Ford stuff. There'll be other stuff. There'll be general performance stuff. Um, we're going to use a lot of Mustangs to show you general performance stuff. You know, simple drag racing techniques that work on any kind of car. But because we've got Fords, that's what we're going to show you. Hopefully, you'll look past the badge and you'll you'll see how you can make your car go faster doing the same stuff. Kind of like what we do with the Mopar stuff. I own all Mopars, but I try to keep the, the, the things that we do as generic as possible and use like Mopars to, you know, to demonstrate. I mean, that's pretty much what we're doing with the Fords. Yep, and we got Roland's new $2 Maverick, which is a six-cylinder Maverick that's $2. now been freshly painted with Rust-Oleum and a roller on the street. So we got everything from $2 Mavericks to $10,000 bracket cars, heads-up index cars. And then there's another new member of the UTG network. We're, we're going to be big. Right? Evan, tell them about your channel. Hey, Evan Smith, and I've known these guys forever. So my channel is a little bit different than Tony's and Stickman's. Um, I still do a mix of new car testing, a lot of the old stuff, Fox Body stuff, but I got my hands on a lot of different automotive and even some transportation you do some exotic stuff. stuff too. Yeah, I do some exotic stuff because I get. I, I'm still a magazine guy. I write for Hot Rod a little bit. I like the dancing. Oh, the dancing? Yeah, never mind. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. well, you know, the pole thing, and that well, went bad one night. Yeah, but, but we he only dances there. under the name Rev and Evan. Right, you know, Rev I'm good Rev with Rev. the Paso Doble and, and all that. You know, I watch a lot of Dancing with the Stars, so I've seen it on TV. Um, be amazed what you could pick up. No, but exotic cars. Yeah, you so like, yesterday I drove a Lamborghini yesterday, and give you a little taste of what a lot of different stuff is like from maybe the new GT500 coming out. Um, to Shelby GT 350s which we drove recently but I like the old stuff too and uh, I guess I cut my teeth really after I took my car right from the street to basically right into stock eliminator where you guys kept to the street and like Lee really just had no rules except for when you raced Street 5.0 um, and just seeing how much power you can make I went kind of the NHRA direction with mine so I'm gonna be hitting some NHRA races with my channel and showing you what makes some of these cars tick, whether it's a nitro car, we could be in the nitro pits one day. I think the stock eliminator stuff. We're looking under the stock eliminator these car. These guys next. want to learn how to make their just like just like we were, you know, back in the day. Right. These guys want to know how to get the biggest bang for their buck, and I think that your background, not you know, your background experience, with stock eliminator cars, because that is the ultimate science in working with the minimums. Yeah, right? and you're looking at all from from bumper to bumper since you're so limited on horsepower. Bumper to bumper, whether it's ceramic wheel bearings or what type of fluids you're going to use for the lowest amount of parasitic drag. Right. Um, every little thing, waxing the car, does it really matter? Front engine dress, what can you get rid of? All the little tips and tricks. So we're going to show you a lot of that stuff. Um, as far as the actual channel, 
I'm Evan Smith, and that's just what the channel name is. Um, there's probably a lot of Evan Smiths, but if you type in Evan Smith Mustang, all my videos will come up and you, you can subscribe. I'm also on uh, Instagram at official Ford guy with two underscores and Evan J. Smith photo where I put up a lot of my NHRA and just road racing, all the stuff I'm out doing, Tony. And I, I appreciate the opportunity to be uh, hanging out with these guys. I appreciate the opportunity to be working with you guys. It's fun. I mean, it's been a long time. You know, it's, it's, like, it's like we're getting back together again. Yeah, and everybody right. looks Let's get the up, band back together again. Everybody looked up to somebody later. back then, right? Like, yeah. you guys were the first ones, you and Neil, and you kind of got it going, and Lee and myself saw what you were doing, and I looked up to Lee, because Lee was doing all the stuff that I wanted to do, but absolutely couldn't afford to do, and I was still driving my car back and forth to college. So, if I broke one of those 28-spline axles, I was done. Meanwhile, Lee's putting slicks on his car, he's building engines, hanging the wheels in the air, and, you know, then you started, Lee, then you started really getting into the heads-up class racing, right? Which was in its infancy back then. Yeah, it was a little like, amateur tour. Talk, talk about what it was like to go from being a Friday night street guy, you know, you're just really just, you and the clock and whatever modifications you make, and then you started going to these different shootouts and running heads-up with guys from all over the country. What was that like? That was a lot of fun. It was uh, basically the same group of guys that we would see whether it was Ohio or Michigan or Texas and it was the same dozen guys that were always there and in the top five qualifiers and yeah it was and, and not to cut you off but you got to remember this was before the internet yeah nobody was on Facebook posting times or even texting each other somehow word of mouth just got around whether you might have to wait three months because I'd write or Neil would write about what Lee did on a Friday night here and somebody's not reading about it till three months later, but eventually, just like today, the word did circulate, so you knew who the hot guys were, probably a lot like the Grumpy Jenkins era where you knew who the, the hot guys were, and I don't mean hot, I mean the fast guys, <laughs> with, a, you know, with, with a 5.0 Mustang. If you go back then, we all had 500 on the phone bills. Yeah, we did. <laughs> Mine was, we my really low did. phone bill was 350, the high was 500. My family thought I was nuts. Like, yeah. hey, I got to talk to these people. You got to have that long distance service. It eventually morphed into email and yeah. IMs and we saved a ton of money. But yeah. so, so tell us, what, what was it like when you went to one of those first races? Do you rem remember like yeah. competing? Yeah, it was uh, basically leave on a Friday, straight after work, drive through the night, get there for uh, Saturday morning, qualify, kind of see where you how you stacked up. and. Right. You know, just kind of stay within the rules the best you could, and and it was pure. It was just pro it was. Tree, heads up. It was. <laughs> I remember Nitrous Pete putting front brake pads in your yeah, van yeah. at Indy wow. in March, um, so that you could drive, you could tow back home yeah. while you were going around. Yeah, yeah. Because he friends. drove to Indy with worn out front brakes, this towing way. the trailer. So listen, okay. The first race I went to, I'll tell you my trailering experience. I got there. I think I trailed it to Texas nonstop. Pulled into Texas Turbos parking lot, and I didn't know how to back it up. <laughs> so I basically went there. You drove straight to Texas. I was you didn't have yeah. to back up on the way. Yeah, that's it. So we're running really warm here, yeah. and we got to get kind of wrapped up. But before we do that, we've got this thing sitting on the trailer behind us. Why don't you tell them what it is? All right, this is my original '87 Mustang, the ones we talked about before. Bought it at Seabreeze Ford. Yeah. Drove it to Anglestown and raced it every day after that. Drove it. 200 plus thousand miles. Um, race it at every track I could race it at wherever I went. Whether I went to cover the event, I'd go and cover the event, race my car, sell magazine subscriptions in the pits and back issues. This thing has been up and down pretty much every direction between here in Michigan and as far south as Georgia. See, so my car was scrapped about four years ago. I sold it. I was only in this whole thing with these guys for a year. Seemed like a lifetime, but it was, it was a year. And then I went off and did really crazy things. And they stuck I'd with this. I'd stand up, but I'm really hot and tired. And I got rid of my car. I sold it to a, I sold it to a dealer, the dealer sold it to another guy. It ended up as a back half race car, and then we were on the trail of it about uh, four years ago now. And I, we actually, we had a guy who was like, he wanted the car to restore. And he, what, what did he say? His, his quote was, what did, what did he say about the tail light? If you can find the tail light, I'll yeah. pull the car around it. Right, if you, right. So, but anyway, we tracked it down and it had been scrapped in Pennsylvania just about a month before we actually found it. So, my car is kaput. Me and Mr. Mustang, which is Steve Collison's car, that's intact in South Jersey. South Jersey. But this one right here, 
If, if you've got a five liter Mustang, if you've got a Fox Body Mustang, or you're into this whole movement, okay, this car right here is, that's your direct ancestor. This is the actual car that helped start this entire movement. What are you gonna do with it? I think we're gonna have to fix it up a little bit. Or just maybe we'll just make it start, stop, and drive it the way it is, I don't know. This door won't open because some 19 year old kid thought it was smart to try to go ramming on a right when I was signaling right to make a right hand turn. But that's how people drive in New York. With uh, this, this company's making literally everything these days for, for these cars, so it's there's no doubt in my mind that it can be restored and brought back to Absolutely. life. Absolutely, no doubt about it. And honestly, that's we saw that 15 or 1600 mile car that was here before, and that's the craze. I mean, will, will people want to restore these cars? Will they put them back to stock? Um, will you put it back to like a, just a period correct kind of thing? This one needs to be you restored know? to day one. Yeah, I agree. You know, and and if if you happen to be in this Mustang, you know, five liter business, you know, you make parts, reproduction parts, anything like that, you want to get involved in this, drop me a line and uh, make something happen. Okay, so how do we close this thing out? Take us out of here, everybody. Well, everybody knows the YouTube channels. Yeah. Check us out. Subscribe. Um, and just get ready as we ramp this thing up because this is just the beginning. We're gonna go. We're gonna go nuts with this stuff. So, everybody, thank you for joining us. Thank, thank you for bringing you. your cars. Thank uh, you. Uh, it's nice what? to be here. Tim, that's a wrap. That's a wrap. <laughs> See you guys tomorrow.